Welcome to everybody. Welcome to our panelists. Welcome to our audience. Thank you for taking the time to join today's webinar. This is the first in the new series which aims to provide actionable insight for the African tourism industry and a hotbed of discussion that I hope is going to provide a foundation for us to plot a collaborative solution and plot a way forwards uh, out of the crisis that we find ourselves in. Now, before we start, we do need to state that obviously the COVID-19 situation is always ever progressing. And as always, the health of our populations and our loved ones comes first. So please heed the advice of the World Health Organization and the respective governments, wherever you may be. Um, now, before we start this week's webinar, I wanted to quickly introduce myself to those who don't know me. My name is John Howell. I'm CEO and founder of Avia Dev Africa. We are the, uh, an aviation development event dedicated to improving air connectivity to, from, and most importantly, within the African continent. Our 2020 event was due to take place in beautiful Madagascar in May, but unfortunately, due to the virus, it's been postponed to the end of September, and we're still hoping we can get through this and uh, start to pick the uh, pick everything up. Um, starting in September. I'm also the host of the only podcast dedicated to African aviation, which is called Aviadev Insight Africa. This can be downloaded for free and found across all platforms. And actually, the audio recording of today will be available there, and you'll get a link to that tomorrow or Monday when we send the follow ups. So, my role here is to represent the aviation sector. I've been actively engaging with them over the last three weeks. We've done three Aviadev webinars so far. And ultimately, over 50% of all international tourists arrive at their destination by air. So a vibrant aviation industry is obviously vital for a sustainable and vibrant tourism sector. There's huge uncertainty in the aviation market in Africa currently, just as there is, of course, in the tourism sector too. So I believe the current situation is an opportunity for us all to reset and reinvent to move forward. Um, last week, I recorded a webinar with the Vice President for Africa, Ayata, and I wanted to share his outlook with you. So I'm just going to share my sound, and I'm just going to share a short clip with you of what he had to say. We are seeing that there is a need for governments to support the airline industry now and in the near future. Future. If airlines on the continent do not get government support sooner, then by the time we get over COVID-19 and get into a mode of recovery, global economic recovery, there probably would not be airlines to support the recovery process. And even if they were, the recovery process would be slower and would take a much longer time Okay, so some we are sobering words there from uh, the, the VP of Africa for IATA and just gives you a, an idea of the kind of conversations that we're having in the avi aviation sector at the moment. So before we start, I just wanted to, for some of you whose first webinar this is, I want to just give you some housekeeping rules. Um, the format of today is a panel format. Only our panelists will have the ability to use their microphones. Should you want to ask a question at any time, please click on the Q&A button on your screen and you can submit your questions there. We'll try our best to get to your questions today, so don't be shy to put those through. After the uh, webinar, we'll send you a copy of the video recording and the audio recording as well. Um, there are also going to be a couple of polls that we're going to ask you to take part in. So I'm going to launch the first one of those now before I, uh, before I, I, I move into the, uh, into the conversation. So. Um, if you could all take a look on your screen and start voting for this question. When do you think African tourism will recover to 2019 levels? I see the votes coming in, so please don't be shy. I'm going to keep this open for another 60 seconds or so. So, yeah, great, fantastic. We've had 70-odd votes, 80, 100, 110, 120. Okay, I'll give you another 15 seconds just to vote on this, and then I'll share the results with you. So make your votes now. Okay, I'm going to close that now. We've had 150 votes, and I'm going to share the results. And I think this could uh, be quite interesting for today. So a few pessimists out there, um, a few optimists looking at late 2020 at 14%, but most people going for 2022 with 42%. So thank you for taking part in that. Um, so that's the first poll. 
I, that's the end of, of my introduction here. What I wanted to now do is introduce my um, co-moderator, who is uh, Kojo Benson-Williams. So over to you, Kojo. The floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. And uh, good morning from Ghana and uh, Accra. And thanks for joining us uh, for this tourism webinar. And our vulnerability has been laid bare. At whatever level that you choose from the act from the acutely personal through widening sphere of connection, our reliance on one another and, and our network is being challenged. Across the world, millions of tragedies are playing out and the root cause obviously is coronavirus. Uh, our objective for this webinar is to bring the conversation and the way forward to you at our lockdown locations or partially lockdown locations. And I mean, we are happy to have our panel, esteemed guests and experts who will who will, who will help us to address some of the challenges. Now, what we intend to do is that there have been a lot of things going on and we know the challenge now. Uh, what we want to use the webinar to do is to, for you to help us you know, address some of the things that our people can do, SMEs, and how Africa's tourism will be going forward. And with this introduction, I would, uh, I would like to uh, bring in Cesar Shona, he's the CEO of the South African Tourism, a post that he's been holding since 2016. And he has depth of knowledge in tourism, banking, and uh, aviation. So, Cesar, I, South African Tourism was, you know, one of the tourism boards that came up with a lot of things, um, you know, in terms of messaging, change your messaging after meetings Africa. Unfortunately, uh, we had to go through this issue. Can you give us your introductory remark and then tell us what you're doing from the South African point of view, but also from the African tourism perspective? Thank you, Kojo, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, wow, what times we find ourselves in. This is something definitely that no one can ever plan for. Uh, to kind of give you a bit of a sense, um, it's a forever changing environment. Literally every hour there's new developments that are happening. And we have to catch up with them and make sure that uh, we, we position ourselves accordingly. A lot of it has been brought through to legislation. So we, again, we can't do much and just kind of fit around that side. So here's a scenario. You know, when your major source markets for tourism are actually uh, at the epicenter of a crisis, you have to readjust in terms of how you, your, your outlook is. Uh, South Africa at the moment is in a lockdown period. We are in the first week of a three-week lockdown. Uh, all of our borders are shut. No airline, both domestic and international, flies in or out of South Africa. So essentially, the whole industry has come to a halt. The trick here, however, is to we say to ourselves, we've got to remain present and top of mind in our imported markets, but we've got to change the shape and form that we are uh, present in it. So we can no longer put up fancy pictures of how great South Africa is, come and visit and everything else. In fact, we're telling people not to visit South Africa. And there lies in the tactical, uh, smart ability to make sure you're still there, but also promoting the safe message that is permeating right across the tourism industry led by UNWTO that essentially says, um, stay home now so you can travel later. And we're all picking up our own local adaptations of that. And uh, the industry is obviously hurting very much because it's essentially closed. And I'm happy to discuss with you some of the other developments that we're picking up in terms of some of the ideas we have uh, going to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar. And uh, I think that like you just... Um, Rightly said, our, our, our industry is battered and uh, it's, it's at this point that we really want to also communicate, even though you want to keep on top of mind, but also be very sensitive of the things that you put up. And also your, uh, your video communicating uh, exactly the times that we are in was a masterstroke. Uh, Carmen, having been the, you know, a, a tourism policy analyst and your quest for intra-Africa, do you think it's the right time to look at it? Into Africa? Africa oh, without good borders. Good morning, right. from... If I may say. Yep. 
Hi, Kodro. Greetings from Rwanda and the East Africa. Thank yes, you. you're rightly so. Uh, I think tourism is, uh, has been embedded in the culture and public policy ideology of, of an essential pillar to achieve endless economic growth in some destinations. So, for instance, some several African governments rely and then prioritize tourism as a super growth industry accounting most of the time, I think, in the range between 4 to 10 percent of uh, their exports. So this crisis uh, has called all of us to look at tourism from a different lens and different angle. So this is a, like really a radical wake up call. And then the way we think about doing business investments, uh, public policy reforms, whether they are monetary or fiscal policy, to address how do we stimulate the economy, create more jobs, but sustainable jobs. So the reality is that we need to change so we can accommodate creativity adjustments, not only for specific countries, but looking at uh, economic regional blocks. And under the continent, we look at Africa in a different angle because we have been relying so much on our external source markets. I think we need to go back to the drawing board and then I think there has to be a shift from inbound to domestic and regional tourism in the near future. Hello, John. Oh, thank you for that, Carmen. Really appreciate the uh, the, the intervention. And I think that it, it's very interesting that it is a bit of a reset. I said, use the words reset and reinvent. And that's why I want to come across to Anita, because, of course, Anita is somebody who's globally trusted and respected and been around tourism development, but also takes a, a view from almost a global standpoint as well with the work that you've had, obviously, advising the Secretary General of the UNWTO, lead consultant at CNN's um, task group as well. So it'd be great to get your sort of uh, initial remarks, uh, Anita. Stunning. Thank you very much. Um, and John and Kojo, firstly, I just want to commend you on putting this conversation together. We're at a really critical time in not just our tourism world, but in the world per se. And your doing this is important because we're still as a world trying to figure out the problem. We're not near trying to figure out the solutions yet. So I commend you for doing this. Um, and I have to say, I'm so excited to see CISA online. I have missed you. You are one of my favorite leaders. I am thrilled you are back. So brilliant. And it's clear to see the impact this is being made. I think from a global perspective, and I speak very much from myself, but also with regards from the Secretary General who knows we're having this conversation, I just want to rewind a little bit, and I forgive me if I'm being controversial. COVID-19 and the crisis of 2020 is not about travel and tourism. It is not about Africa. It's about humanity. And we need to be really clear about this. We have never faced a global crisis before that has been invisible. Terrorism, you can see. Economic downturns, you can see. Natural disasters, you can see. We are dealing with a crisis of fear. There's physical fear, we know that. There is now financial fear, as people fear for their jobs, they fear for their businesses, they fear for their economies. But more importantly, there's a mental health crisis because of the fact that we are dealing with something that I don't know if it's in my office in London. I have no idea if it's in the room. So there is a psychological element here that we need to deal with. I want to do some serious applauding to CISA and South African tourism because he ran not just one campaign, but two campaigns. Firstly, magnification of the Travel Tomorrow initiative by the UNWTO in a South African way. That was a beautiful execution because it showed a maturity of leadership of recognizing if we are going to be global citizens as part of one of the most powerful global industries for economic development, social development, cultural, environmental, and spiritual, stay home. Keep dreaming, but stay home. As importantly, if not more, there's a second campaign and Cisa, I'd love if you could share it as a link after or whenever works about the lockdown. His Excellency President Ramaphosa is being praised around the world because even before a crisis hit, the showing of a risk of one caused a 21-day lockdown. And that's scary because a lockdown is a lock-in and psychologically people are getting suffocated around the world. We're not used to being told stay home and unless we're in the medical industry and community, all we can do is actually stay out of the way. 
But CISA and his team put together a piece of communication around the outbreak, which was brilliant because it made people recognize in South Africa that everyone is fearful. Everyone is worried. That was masterful because it allowed South Africans to come together as one along with the global community itself. So I just wanted to point on that because we're not dealing with a crisis that is just about our industry. It's also a crisis that has exposed globally that travel and tourism is at the heart of the global community in terms of its economic engine. That does not work without aviation. As the world starts unlocking, and John, you're an expert in this area, as the world starts unlocking, it's going to be trade first to stimulate the value chains, which will also impact SMEs. Then it will be domestic tourism, then regional, then international. It's not about airline access. It's not about travel. It's not about cost. It's about people's confidence. People are scared to be with other people right now. So slowly, 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 the world will unlock and we need to be there to make sure that Africa is working with Africa to get the mobility going in the skies, on the grounds, through the value chain, and through travel and tourism itself. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Thank you for setting the scene, Anita. Really appreciate it. Now, um, somebody, uh, uh, another panelist that we have is Judy Kefagona, who's the um, founder and principal consultant at Sustainable Travel and Tourism Agenda, or STTA. Uh, Judy is a sustainability ambassador and a coach with over 20 years experience working in sustainable tourism, just to give her a little bit of an intro. But do you see this as an opportunity, Judy, as um, the sustainability agenda to be coming right to the top? Because as I say, this is a reset button. This is a reinvention time. Do you think that sustainability is going to be play a big part in this reinvention? Thank you, John. Um, good afternoon, everyone from Nairobi, Kenya. It's a beautiful day. Even with the lockdown, it's still a beautiful day. Um, it has been said, and I think it has now been documented in the last few days, so a few weeks I have read it, that sustainability will eventually, either by disaster or design, take over tourism and all sectors. It was a matter of time through design or by disaster, that sustainability becomes the solution that the world is looking for. And we have been forced to stay in our homes, even as we stay in our homes, we know that the things we held so dear, we thought that we needed to consume in certain ways. We have realized that we can live without them. And so we are being brought back to reality. We are being brought back to limits. So even tourism has got limits. And that's why I concur and support, and it is my personal belief that tourism does not need a recovery. Tourism needs a restart, a complete restart. And that restart will bring us back um, uh, to the basics about tourism. In the 1970s, scholars raised, 1970s, 1980s, scholars in tourism raised concerns about the ability of tourism, particularly in Africa, in its current form, to transform African economies and bring well-being to destinations. The school of thought was discounted in progressive years when certain metrics for measuring tourism were introduced. It was about revenues, it was about the jobs that are uh, created, and yes, the arguments became the, the discounting arguments became the basis of growing tourism. And I'm not saying that those metrics are absolutely wrong. I'm just saying that with COVID-19, we probably would have to rethink them. We would have to get to a point where we rethink um, uh, things like growth. Do we need more growth or do we need more sustainable growth? How are we going to grow Africa's tourism going forward? Now, one of the two things that those early scholars in the 70s and 80s said about tourism, which were ignored when their, 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 their school of thought was discounted, was that they mentioned two things in the thoughts. They mentioned risk. They said this is a risky industry. And they mentioned another thing, which is well-being. And when we are resetting tourism today, I think one of the things that Africa will have to think about is how to de-risk tourism. I don't know whether this word exists, but we've got to de-risk tourism. And how will Africa de-risk its tourism? 
Part of what has been said by Anita is what we need to do. Africa will de-risk its tourism by paying attention to the largest segment that drives Africa's tourism, which are the SMEs. We will not go forward, we will not go Af grow Africa's tourism, we will not make it a dependable economic segment that drives economic growth in Africa if we ignore the SMEs that drive Africa's tourism. And today, as Africa's tourism crumbles, unfortunately, and you have said it rightfully, this is not COVID-19, is not a tourism problem. It is a, a humanity problem. It is a people's problem. It is a health issue. But yes, it is affecting tourism. But when the statistics of tourism losses will be written, unfortunately, the statistics of many SMEs will not make it into those lists. They will remain faceless. When we start documentation and when we start recovery programs, they will remain very faceless. And that's why I'm, I'm, I am hesitant to talk about recovery and I would like to talk about reimagining tourism, thinking that there is another world order, there is another way in which we can do tourism. So in place of um, um, economic recovery programs, I would be looking at relief programs because relief programs go beyond economics to social issues that are facing the tourism industry today. We've got hundreds, millions of jobs that have been lost in tourism. Every day when we talk about the power of tourism, we talk about one in 11 jobs that are created by tourism. We must start asking ourselves, in these 11 jobs, what percentage of them is secure? And that's what I mean by having relief programs that will look at people issues around tourism, that will look at social issues around tourism. Uh, let me stop there for now and I will continue later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Fujiri, for, 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 for your remark. Uh, I'd like to bring in Mohamed Hersi, and he, he joined us. Mohamed Hersi is the president of the Kenya Tourism Federation and also the director of uh, operations at Pullman's Tours and Safaris. Now, you know, COVID-19 COVID has been a, a stress test for global hotel chains and, and generally for the hospitality sector. But as an operator and as a voice in, in Kenya's tourism, space what do you tell members because two days ago the, the cabinet secretary for tourism najib balala spoke about maybe it may just be the time for a paradigm shift in terms of our products to 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 the domestic and regional uh, markets thank you Koyo, and uh, good afternoon everyone uh, for those of you in our time zone uh, my apologies i was not able to join earlier now, Kojo and everyone, the, the crisis we are facing is beyond tourism. And this is uh, what uh, Kefa just uh, mentioned as well. Uh, we are talking of a uh, global uh, you know, problem. And uh, it's just not about tourism, it's about manufacturing. I mean, we've never ever imagined if somebody asked you and told you that uh, in uh, four weeks time, all airlines will be grounded. Uh, you look at them and wonder where they've come from because nobody will have believed that, but that's what we have today. So this is just beyond tourism. And at the moment, and this is what I've said in many other forums, is that uh, we are looking far beyond uh, uh, just business. We are looking at survival, remaining alive. And one of the biggest challenges, and this is one of the things that uh, many of us are not seeing, is that... Uh, Recovery is one. Then number two is that our source market. These people are dying. You look at Italy, a source market that supports Malindi, Watamu in Kenya. They're dying in their hundreds on a daily basis. That's a very tragic scenario. Now it has shifted to UK, another strong source market. Then you go to the US, another strong source market. So Kojo, we may recover, in terms of uh, the um, crisis getting out of the way, virus may be defeated, but I need to also mention something, and that's very, very important, that we are reaching a stage, even when we start getting into recovery or restarting, as uh, Kefa will say, the, the thing is that you are not confident of being with strangers in one place. You're just worried. You don't know who's carrying the virus. 
You don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know whether the thing will strike again. So at the moment, we're actually not talking about any recovery. First things first is to remain alive and hope that we all come out of this in one piece because as global society and as players in the tourism industry, whether in Kenya, whether in the region and globally, we should be able to come back. And we've known how to come back. But the thing is, this is not the time to do it, but also it's an opportunity for us to uh, revisit how we do things. But again, looking at COVID-19, it's beyond tourism. It's not something any one of us will have mitigated against. None of us ever saw it coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you. Thank you for the introductory remark. Uh, Carmen wanted to chip in when uh, Judy was talking. So if I may go to Carmen to, 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 to have 30 seconds uh, in, in intervention from you. Well, thank you, uh, Kodro. I think I just maybe the same point as uh, Mohammed and Judy. I think we, we needed to look at this crisis beyond tourism. And I, I agree with Mohammed. What, what do we define by the source market? What is our actually current community we want to engage with in tourism tomorrow? So if we have to rebuild the consumer conf confidence into some of our destinations, we have to go and then look at another script and then design a different story. I don't know who, who's in charge of marketing. This is going to be a very different era. But also from Judy, I think the people who have been involved in, in tourism, if you look at the small SMEs, women, youth, and uh, opportunities available for them, they were always outside the box. They were not really included in the whole picture. So how do we redo it again, but at this time properly? And uh, the community relations between the tourism industry and then the need to re-engineer what we do. But also I'd like to bring another element. We are, there are things we are not even discussing. You know, everything is, is on hold. Uh, we need to talk about conservation, climate change, and then our resilience and our biodiversity, all those aspects we have been relying on so much. And now we have to go and think, how do we do it again? Especially for countries in East Africa, we rely so much on those uh, key assets. And uh, Anita mentioned something. This is a humanity crisis. Is us as human beings, how do we connect? Uh, what, what, is, what is the difference or what is the parameter or the barrier between work and leisure? Uh, we need to prioritize our well-being and then a sense of equity and then the long-term sustainability of how the world works. I think we have been shifting so much on the profits, uh, getting every single dollar out of the tourists. And now uh, our ambitions and our goals have to be reshifted and re-engineered completely. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, I wanted to bring Sisa in before I go to our first question. Sisa, you, you the, remember we had a conversation in South Africa where you were very passionate about how Africa can come you know, as, a, as, a, as one and then be able to leverage on our key strengths. Now, if you look at South Africa and you know, beginning from uh, the, the start of the COVID, you've, you've been putting up different messages, rallying the, the, you know, the industry together. As a tourism board, what do you think you know, South Africa, West Africa, East Africa, you can do or come together to be able to see how you can forge ahead? Uh, thank you for that. Just, just to give some uh, context, is that South Africa has put tourism in the center of its economic recovery. We're actually de-risking the economy away from natural resources, gold, you know, mining, etc., and looking more into the tourism space. But of course, sustainability and total inclusiveness becomes a key driver around it. Um, you know, the crisis itself brings about, in a very strange way, and it's very difficult to think about it now, certain opportunities, right? The first one I rightly aligned with John, we're pressing the reset button. So there's no longer business as usual. We can start to do those things that we've always thought of doing, but never quite got there. But the crisis done has really pushed it to the fore. Right now, South African Tourism Board, we're looking at what are called the hygienic factors. What do we need to fix within our call it a hardware environment, whether it's policies, legislations, our data collection, as an example, in order for us to be able to make better decisions going forward. It's also press a reset button in terms of 
realigning in terms of uh, how the, the tourism sector was stacked up. And it's looking inside outwards. And again, it's about saying domestic tourism, we've got to build, build a very robust domestic tourism sector, overlay that then with the regional uh, sector as well and international one. We can no longer assume that the, the schedules of those airlines that used to service our countries will continue after all of this. It starts all over again from scratch. Then how then do we reconnect them in a way that suits our strategy as opposed to us fitting to what's already existing as well? We are also looking at different scenarios because we have no idea. We have no idea how long this pandemic is going to last for. So you don't know how long to plan for. We are looking at SMEs. We want to support them instinctively, but are you supporting them for a month, two months, three months, six months, a year? Because all of that's going to have a lot of drain on the fiscus, which has got zero revenue coming through because everything's coming to a stop. So it's all of these uh, coming to one pot, but also trying to simulate what does the future look like after COVID? How are we going to do conferencing, which is a big revenue earner for us, right? Is not that we're used to doing things virtually, right? Will that be the way things go? And our view for now is to say, well, actually, it's going to grow. You will still have the physical contact, but you now have adopted a new ways of kind of doing things as well. So how do you embed this new norm into how you do things as opposed to try to change it? And then lastly, fully agree that trade, you know, will kind of lead the recovery. But tourism is trade. It is trade in the sense that if you look at balance of payments of many economies around the world, that's where you earn your forex. Essentially, it's an export sector. And again, it will also, lastly, be the first sector that will be the first to recover or reignite itself relative to other places. Because you can't store tourism. You know, it's a, it's a perishable product. You know, you've got to keep that kind of going. And it's in these pieces together as to see how we're actually going to replicate it. If I may just add one more thing there as well, is that the reality of this is that many of the businesses in tourism, the supply side, will go bankrupt. That's the reality. And with it, there'll be job losses. So again, what is the new supply side of tourism going to look like? And what will be the new habits of the visitors? How are they going to consume tourism? Surely it can't be business as usual. And what's the new future? And I think as Africa, we have the opportunity to unite and saying, how do we start to put together a view as to what the new supply will look like and what the new consumer will look like? So you can start to set the trend or standards, at least for Africa's concern. Wonderful. Thank you, Cesar. Um, we've had uh, lots and lots of questions coming in, and uh, I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but uh, our good friend, Professor Marina Novelli, has actually asked a really interesting question here as well. And she said, obviously, the, the move towards domestic and regional travel, which we've, I think we, we are agreeing is probably the first thing that will recover post-COVID, also has, what, what do we see? What does the panel see are the key challenges? But also, I'm going to add opportunities to shift away from this reliance on long haul tourism and move towards, um, you know, more domestic, more regional tourism, which is, has been a frustration and has, has actually held back the development of air transport in Africa, because quite often the airlines have, have been very keen to fly long haul before they've been keen to fly regionally. And we've suffered from that as a continent for, for a long time. So I wanted to come to, to Judy, because uh, I think she, she might have some interesting uh, takes on this. So over to you, Judy. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Marina, thank you for that question. I think um, there are a number of uh, challenges that tourism will face because of the austerity measures that tourism has taken right now. And like we say, this is not just about tourism, it's about everybody. But there are austerity measures that tourism has taken and one of them has been to lay off employees. And so we know it takes time to build the quality and the skills of employees. It is not guaranteed that these employees are always waiting to be absorbed back, especially when you've been sent on unpaid leave. I, I learned a new terminology during this crisis. 
that there's something else that the industry is calling undetermined leave. I don't know what that is in the labor laws, but some, some staff have said to me, Judy, we have been sent on undetermined leave. So there will be uh, loss of skills as tourism uh, recovers and we have heard from CISA, it will not be business as usual. Travel will change, the traveler requirements will change. I think one of the big things that tourism in Africa should be thinking about now is how do we get ready our employees and skilled labor to serve us as we restart uh, this industry. So the austerity measures will affect skills in tourism. We don't know whether this, uh, the current employees will be available and if they will be available, are they going to be able to serve the, the traveler that will re-emerge as tourism uh, restarts uh, post uh, uh, COVID-19. Another area that is going to be a challenge, which Sisi has also talked about, is the supply chain. We know that uh, the tourism industry, again, is served by some, so many hundreds of uh, uh, SMEs that service the tourism industry. Over the years, they have built uh, certain skills. They know how the industry operates. They have built uh, relationships. Now, some of them uh, will go out of business and many of them and will never recover. So the industry will be looking for new suppliers as we recover. Are we getting ready for those new suppliers? How quickly are we able to turn around new suppliers to satisfy the demand uh, um, of the industry? That is another area that will be a challenge for the tourism industry. But yet the biggest opportunity that I see coming out of this crisis is the opportunity to build new alliances. And I think every crisis presents us with an opportunity to build new alliances. And that only happens if we are able to correctly analyze our current situation. Right now we're operating in an emergency situation, but we cannot just have measures to take care of the emergency. We must look beyond emergency. It's like being, in, uh, being rushed to ER and the doctors finish with you at ER. No, you don't. At ER, you get stabilized. Post ER, you are managed. We find out what medication is good for you or will make you recover fully. And what are you going to do after that? So there are opportunities for us to think post ER. What is going to happen post emergency? Some of the things that we are talking about today, putting aside funds and doing all those sort of things, for me, those are things that are, we need to do in the ER. But what will sustain and move tourism forward in Africa is how we think post the emergency stage and how we deal with issues post that emergency stage. But I'm excited at the opportunity to look at new alliances. Whether those new alliances mean building intra-Africa travel and trading with Africa in terms of tourism, and how that works, uh, irrespective of the, all the challenges, we could think long term and how we could bring this into uh, fruition. And uh, uh, my encouragement is that let us look at the new alliances that emerge. Whether these new alliances emerge out of us looking at our institutional infrastructures and how we manage and operate tourism today at country level or even within Africa, looking at the institutional infrastructure and making it more inclusive will help us to build more alliances. It's an opportunity for us to bring down uh, 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 barriers because tourism is so segmented today, it's so compartmentalized, it's so sectionalized. If we bring down those barriers, we, 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 we can and we could build stronger alliances that will bring more people on board that could strengthen our resolve and will strengthen our treatment program beyond the emergency room. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anita, I, 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 I wanted to come to you um, about how, for example, because we've seen governments across the world in Africa also announce stimuluses, stimulus packages, uh, and we're saying for big corporates, for shareholders, and, and you know, all of that. But, but they've been concerned about how we seem not to pay attention to SMEs or sometimes whether all these stimulus packages are real. What do you, what do you, what do you have to say to that? 
It's a, it's, it's a great question and I, it's a challenging question, but I thank you for that. And I want to please weave it into what Judy was saying in the question that was asked by the professor by, about domestic tourism. The stimulus packages are going to be incredibly important. The challenge is always how, does, how do people access, especially SMEs, the money within those stimulus packages? This is where I have to go back and say, Mother Nature is very smart. She ultimately, she ultimately wins. This whole issue and the crisis has caused an incredible examination of what ultimately we are as a global community, as, an, as a global economy. If we take that down at a national level, and it goes to something CISA said about the supply chains, what's happening in terms of stimulus packages is that absolutely they're going to be mobilized. However, there are three reasons why fundamentally domestic tourism is going to grow first. Firstly, as I said, it's about confidence levels, and governments know this. People are not comfortable going out. Travel is going to go from in our homes to next door, to next region, and into the next state or province. Then it will widen. Importantly, governments also know now the value of the travel and tourism ecosystem at an economic level. That has been made very transparent, not just because of the travelers, but the value chains, including SMEs that support that. Third reason why I think domestic tourism is going to grow, because people have become so community-minded and not just online community, but caring about people around us, people are going to want to have an impact in supporting local people through value chains, through SME development, through supply chains, by live traveling locally. So governments, when they put these stimulus packages in place, they know that by not only making the money available, but reminding people of their nationalism and their opportunity to help their countries rebuild, that's going to directly support domestic tourism growth. It's fabulous because again, we're human beings before we're tourists. We're human beings before we are professionals. People are going to want to stay home to help rebuild home. Very importantly as well is the whole issue of, is it recovery, is it re-engineering? I do believe, as you say, we have this time now to re-engineer how we look at travel and tourism and the bigger economy and society because we don't know when we're going to be able to open up our countries again. We don't know when our borders and our doors are going to open. But we can use this time, exactly as Judy said, to actually start looking at, let's create the relationships at a macro level and a micro level to start figuring out how do we re-engineer better. Like CISA was saying, let's look at supply and demand and make sure we're optimizing. We've got the UNWTO for the first time working with ICAO, the WHO, IATA, WTTC as one global coalition. Within the UNWTO's recommendations yesterday to global leaders, it is about focusing on making sure stimulus packages are put aside for travel and tourism and make sure domestic tourism is part of that package's application. So in so many ways, this, this, this whole crisis has created such a profound opportunity to relook the word sustainability. Sustainability is not just about green. It's not just about what Mother Nature normally taught us to look at. It's economic sustainability, social sustainability, cultural sustainability, and critically, it's spiritual sustainability as we don't want tourism for tourism's sake. As has already been said, we've seen the challenges. We've seen the issues we face with overcrowding, over tourism. We're being given an unbelievable opportunity to relook our ways to make sure that travel and tourism continues to be a critical vehicle of global health, not just economically, not just socially, but at a mental health level, because our world needs to connect. People need to travel. Travel and tourism has become a necessity, not just a requirement in some areas of business in some areas of the world. And importantly as well, exactly as Mohammed said earlier, we're looking at other people around the world that we used to depend on for travel and tourism as our source markets. They are hurting right now. Everyone has been equal in the suffering that is taking place because the fear is equal. So governments are recognizing the stimulus packages are there not just for the economic impact it's going to have, but the social impact. And they're redirecting it in ways to allow for re-engineering of countries at an economic and social level that allows for scale. Do it at a macro level, get the airlines out again, get the trade moving, both as CISA said, human trade, as well as the, in terms of travel as, a, as an export sector, as well as manufacturing in the supply chains, 
but also recognizing get travel and tourism working because people in a country need it internally and as well as when they go outside. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. People need travel and tourism. And I want to come to you now, Mohammed. Um, we've had, I'm trying to group some of the questions together. Our good friend, uh, Kwache Donkor down there in South Africa from Africa uh, Tourism Leadership Forum and Africa Tourism Partners has asked us a question. I think with your hat on is the tourism, uh, Kenya Tourism Federation hat on. How can your government support now, right now? Like, what are you looking for? What are you lobbying for? And what are you hearing at the moment from the SMEs? We've talked about the SMEs and their importance and how they're being affected. So um, if you could pick up on that, that'd be fantastic. I uh, think, John, the uh, our government has already done a couple of things, even uh, way before they started uh, tackling the private sector or helping the private sector. And one of the key things that we did just a few weeks uh, into this uh, COVID crisis uh, was uh, announcement on some funding and uh, the tax breaks as well. The first one was a uh, reduction of value added tax, which applies to everybody uh, from 16% to 12%, uh, no, to 14%. Then the second one was also reduction of uh, pay as you earn for employees, uh, down from 30% to 25%, which basically means that uh, you're giving a little bit more, or rather you're leaving some money in the pockets of the staff. Yesterday, as I was preparing for this um, uh, webinar, the, I asked the government, uh, what is the value of the taxation aspect where they have been able to reduce the pay as you earn and also been able to reduce VAT? We are looking at on about $1.2 billion. Government has, basically, they have not, they're not going to take uh, close to 120 billion uh, Kenya shillings, which is quite substantial. Uh, looking that uh, they are going to have reduced uh, collection uh, for the Exchequer ETC. Then the other bit that was also announced uh, right at the beginning was some uh, We've had some problems uh, with Mohammed, so we'll try and get him back and we'll come, come back to him. Um, so yeah, back to you Kojo. Okay, uh, okay, I, I think I'm again. But again, uh, we've been receiving a lot of questions and one area that people are asking is, the African tourism products, usually, or most of it than not, is not targeted at you know, other people. I mean, for, for, for Africans, for domestic uh, tourism markets. Carmen, with your job with East African Platform and you know, trying to even get the, the region East Africa to come together, how do, do we then move from having, of course, we live in a global space, but also the bedrock of tourism will always be your domestic tourism or your regional tourism. How do you, you know, tackle this question? Uh, thank you so much, Kojo. I, I think uh, Anita and Judy uh, clearly made uh, a good uh, statement saying that uh, before we after this crisis we have been locked into our homes we have no left our, our own homes our own uh, spaces so when we leave our homes and then it's safe and uh, okay we probably be willing to go and see places we have never been and we had we didn't even bother to go to so most likely you're going to explore the next cafe your next restaurant you're going to discover that five miles away there's a butcher who, who is a like, local so i think those products the reason why we were relaxed is just because we saw the source market reliant so much the americans the western and we designed a product for them and i think it's time for us africans and i think i i, I will not be hesitant to say this that we are given a golden opportunity to bring back the owners of those assets you know, you cannot stage a culture event if you don't involve the community. You cannot have a, an ecosystem which is healthy if it's not connected by those small SMEs, the people who sell the tomatoes on the, on, at the market, those who do the, the food production. These are local people. So our industry, for the first time, I think, before we go far, we realize that there are things we were relying on from so much from outside that actually can be done and then are produced locally. We need to change our, 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 our dimension of how we appreciate what we have. And I agree, uh, I, th I think I've seen some comments that some of the products we have in, uh, I'm probably talking about the East African community, 
have to change. Uh, I, I don't think we can continue selling what uh, we sold a few months ago, two weeks ago, to a local or a domestic market. We know that very well, that what I like and what I'm interested in is going to be completely different from someone who comes from Italy, for instance. So it's, it's a matter of giving pri priorities to the communities. And I insist here, the community doesn't have to be just an East African community. It could be a community within the East African context on how we do things differently. But also allow me to, to kind of like say something else, which for me is very important. The investment models, we will likely have to change pretty dramatically in this context, because this crisis has uh, taught us that some destination will have more control of their future. They can set the new rules, they can set the new regulations, they can set what is the product they want to put. Uh, forward. But at the same time, some destination may be so desperate for economic development and they will be willing to mortgage the future on the hope of a future dream. So how do we strike the balance? So for me, some products have to evolve, have to be changed, but we need to also be careful the economic development doesn't come at a cost. Absolutely agree with that 100% Carmen. Now, um, as, I, as I explained at the beginning, I wanted to bring here some of the conversations that we've been having from the aviation sector. And um, a lot of these questions have been coming up across, uh, across both the chat and the Q&A as well, which are things talking about the Pan-African visa facilitation, allowing it, making it easier for people to move around. We're seeing a lot of movement with that over the last couple of years, uh, with certain countries are taking the lead on this, but there's still a long way to go in terms of visa facilitation, but also from an aviation perspective goes hand in hand is the ability to get traffic rights to actually have the permission to fly into another country within Africa has again been, been something that's been a challenge. And it's something that we advocate, two things is collaboration, but also I think that now is potentially the opportunity to do the open skies agreement. This was first, the Yamasukro decision declaration was first discussed in 1988. It hasn't been implemented and we're in 2020. So now that exactly to, to fit, sort of fit in with what you were saying, um, Carmen and Judy and, and Anita is, it's not business as usual. We need to go back and we need to say, okay, we have an opportunity now to, to, to uh, sort of go from that side. So I wanted to, um, bring CESA in on that just to see what you think in terms of uh, the facilitation of travel generally is it improving and is this the opportunity that we needed almost to reset the button absolutely um, the reset button and we keep on repeating this is allows us to build from the bottom up it allows us to build with the consumer in mind so they can reverse engineer if you know who you're targeting, then you can build specific facilities towards that point. There's also chains in trends. People no longer visit spots or products anymore. It's experiences. So therefore, if you're able to kind of put that at the forefront, then that becomes uh, an essential element to it. Um, I alluded earlier on that this is the perfect time in this quiet time to do all of the spade work that we had not done previously. We have set on decisions, not implemented. Well, guess what? Now we don't have a choice. We've got to implement Yamasukra Declaration in open skies in order just for us as our survival as a country, I mean, as a continent. Secondly, as well, is that we've got to realize that as African countries, that our fate is actually intertwined, that we will not, we can't recover or come out of this in isolation to other African countries, that we're actually all linked in the sense that how then do we start to define the Africa experience as far as possible and have that as a posture to the rest of the world. But we've got to consume it ourselves first before we start to outlay it out towards there as well. And I think there lies in some of the, of the trickery that comes through there as well. And then, you know, tourism bodies, how then do we start to align and work together? And it doesn't have to be 54 countries all at the same time, but regionally. So, you know, the Sadiq region, the East Africa region, the West region, the Central region, we've got to start to pull all these pieces together and start to look at each other as not just as, 
you know, just fellow African countries, but also as source markets. Because once you look at it that way, you start to say, well, what does my traveler want and how do I make sure that I'm able to provide it within the context that we're in? So I think my last point there is that, you know, Africa has got to unite. Africa has got to put its pieces together. We need it just to, as a form of survival out of this. And having products, uh, experiences rather, that are fit for purpose based on the audience we're trying to serve. I love it. Unite to survive. I think that's a really, really nice sort of little soundbite that we've got. So um, Judy has a hand raised, so I'm going to come to Judy for a quick intervention. Um, thank you, John. Um, uh, when when Carmen was uh, talking, um, I wanted to add on to a very important point that was earlier on mentioned by CISA, but which we have not picked up that as, as uh, Africa moves forward uh, to restart uh, its tourism, to reimagine tourism, there's one area that we must pay attention to and must be honest with ourselves about. And this is about data. Tourism data in Africa has been said over and over again, is not reliable. And when you are in, in an ER situation and you're using unreliable data for recovery, then you know that your recovery is going to be short term. You'll be back to the ER often. And data going forward is going to be very important for Africa. And this data will have to uh, recover. Like Sisi says, it's time that we have to think our policies. How do we treat? SMEs and their data in tourism. Often you don't get to hear much about SMEs and their data in tourism. The much that we hear about them in, in, in Africa is uh, probably their numbers. Most of the time they are demonized by mainstream tourism industry. They are called all sorts of names. And yes, we do know that they have challenges but if we also acknowledge that they form a large segment of our tourism industry and are critical in moving our tourism industry from being a big SME, because that is what we have learned from this crisis, that the tourism industry in Africa is a huge SME. Because I could not explain why a week into the first lockdown in Europe, some companies had sent 100% of their staff into undetermined and paid leave without even three months salary or 50% salary. How is it that an industry that is so huge that is driving Africa's economy cannot pay its employees for three months into a crisis, full salaries? Then it means we're just a huge SMEs pretending to be a sector. And why? It's because uh, to a certain extent, we have not dealt with issues of data appropriately and effectively. So part of what Africa has to deal with in restarting tourism is to rethink measurement, is to rethink its numbers, is to rethink the data that comes through and whether what comes out of the end of the pipe, what we put in the public space, actually reflects what tourism is in Africa. And that ties down to my earlier point about uh, talking about emphasizing tourism growth uh, instead of sustainable tourism growth. Because tourism growth has, has told us that because we're so focused on that growth, we try and put everything in the basket without even knowing what's inside that basket. Whether that it, what's inside that basket is rotten, one of them, and will affect the entire basket. No, we just want growth. So we throw anything that shows growth is thrown into the basket. And we don't pay much attention to data. So going forward, we must, Africa must pay attention to its data. And if we need to sit down on Africa and say, these are the metrics that count for us, this is what measures for us, tourism performance, so be it. But it will make a huge part of Africa's um, restart of tourism post COVID-19. Thank you, Judy. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point because we need data to be able to do it, you know, every project, you know, do the, uh, the post COVID 
plants and all of that. Uh, at this point, I think that we are 11 o'clock, but we will take our closer remark. Anita, let me come to you. Uh, how, how do do us or how do you uh, or allied bodies like our, ourselves encourage to, the tourism boards, the ministries and allied companies to work together? And how would they look post COVID? What are the solutions that we can be able to, to, to recommend to SMEs, tourism operators going forward? It's, um, I'm, I'm grateful for the question and it goes back equally to what John had mentioned earlier. It's interesting because the global airline community, aviation per se and tourism, they know the opportunity in Africa. We haven't leveraged it. And my great, great hope is that we don't look back on this crisis and this time we've been given to rethink and re-engineer our industry and feel we've wasted it. If we look at single African air transport market, regimes around visas, like for instance, ASEAN has, now is the time to have those conversations. And it's not the same as it was when we had conversations before. COVID-19 has revealed the, not only the value of the travel and tourism market, but the scale that is required for us to now grow once again. We have these source markets on our doorsteps. And it's exactly as, as Sisa was saying and Mohammed was saying earlier, our traditional source markets, we need to shift how we look and how we value these. The fact that we have the continent able to work for the continent must be part of the solution going forward. A couple of reasons for this. Not only is it about the recognition of the value of travel and tourism, there's a new recognition amongst the values that exist within travelers. COVID-19 has changed how we view our worlds as global citizens. What we value in our lives has been changed because so much has been taken away. The values we have for one another have also shifted. That is going to impact the travel and tourism experience. And when it look at the entire hospitality chain itself, the hardware is going to become less important as the software becomes more important, how people engage with one another. Ours is a continent that has always been at its heart, one is the strongest in the world in terms of the human experience. We need to leverage that. We need to leverage that not only in how we design our product and our services, but how we look at our neighbors. Exactly as Cisa said, it's not gonna happen times 54 immediately, but let's just start. Let's make those connections with logistical systems, whether it's air, whether it's actual visa policies themselves, to start the spread of the interconnectedness to start the opportunity to really get the scale of growth that we need. We cannot have a growth being at a micro level, one by one by one. We need to find solutions that magnify those ones to connect so that we can actually get the scale we need for the speed of impact that is going to allow both corporates and SMEs to grow at the same time because they're working together to stimulate that growth. Aviation is at the heart of that, we know that, then let's unlock the skies. Let's do it now because we have a case not just for the rightness of doing it, but for the business case of making it happen, which is going to turn into a social case and by implication, a political case. But please, God, may we not waste this time to have the conversations we need to make the changes that we can actually benefit from equally at a time when we can open our doors and open our skies again. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. Uh, Carmen, you know, often than not, we've seen policies, we've seen documents, we've seen a lot of uh, papers that have been shared by academia and experts. Going forward, what do you think that experts should also factor in their, you know, in their policy papers to ensure that we, we come out very practical, you know, in terms of how we, 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 we practice tourism? Well, thank you, Kojo. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to borrow what Anita mentioned. I think this is a very key and important uh, point. For the for, for once and for the first time, tourism is going to be taken seriously. If you look at the uh, budget allocation when it comes to tourism, tourism is always the sick child. It gets less money, it gets less attention, and in some countries, it's not even given a prominence in, in decision-making process. So at the policy level, we're going to appreciate tourism as a, as a key component of the whole economy because trade, uh, movement of people, services, medical tourism, educational tourism, name it, tourism is everywhere. 
So for once, I think uh, policymakers will pay attention. I think uh, Mohammed alluded to this. It's not just about uh, policymaking and then discussing about the future of tourism, but I think now it will be at the heart of many, many destinations. Uh, but I would like also to mention that uh, we need also to leverage on uh, policies around use of the technology, how do we connect? Because we've seen in the last three weeks that some destinations have gone far and then they become more uh, uh, open to virtual reality and then showing us what they have. So how do we use technology to kind of like enter to a new sphere, whether it's in education, SMEs, data, and uh, all those aspects? So maybe borrowing from Judy, she said, what, what do we have in the basket? Do we put all eggs in one basket? For me, I think we have to ask ourselves which egg in the basket is no longer important. And there are going to be many policies out there which are not going to be important. We have to make deliberate decisions and signal to the rest of the world and to our partners which direction are we taking. If we stand by saying that our tourism is important to our economy, can we reevaluate our measurement of the success? If we have been relying only on our GDP contribution as, as a measure of success or as a metrics of success, we know definitely that that measurement no longer works. So, and then from CISA from South Africa, you know, is it the, uh, the discussion between product or experience? If we are focusing on experience, then the measurement of experience from academic standpoint is different. We are no longer to say, we can't longer continue to say the number of visitors and say we had 1.5 million visitors and be happy with it. I think that, that con cannot work anymore. If we want to measure success based on tangible resources and say job created, but how much do we pay? Can we guarantee three months of payments? leave uh, paid, uh, healthcare and uh, employment possibilities and SMEs to have access to finance when they are uh, facing some challenges. Those require now new policies, which were not really connected to tourism. We are looking at monetary uh, fiscal policies. How are our financial institutions uh, answering some of the key issues our SMEs are facing today? So Kodro, I would say, whether it's a policy making process we're going to go through, whether we want to measure the data from a different angle and then we decide what is going to be the new index or so the metrics we are going to use, it's going to be a very interesting um, era. And then I'm, I'm delighted that actually we are part of this to be re-engineering, redesigning and discussing about how we were part of the, the problem. I think all of us, we can agree that we're part of the problem but how can we be part of the solution from now? Absolutely, how can we part the, we were part of the problem, how can we be part of the solution? And I want to pick up on the, the technology um, element that's kind of come through, because we've had a lot of questions and a lot of uh, uh, contributions on the chat side of things. And I want to come to you, Cesa, because you've had, um, there's quite a, quite a lot of people have written about the virtual tours that you're doing of say Robben Island and things like that, you know, the other attractions in, in South Africa. And obviously they're being very um, successful. We are also right now, even as myself as an event organizer, we are now having this meeting via this technology. And you mentioned earlier that the MICE business, the meetings, incentive, conference and exhibitions is huge for South Africa. It's huge for Africa generally. And we're always encouraging people build more convention centers, et cetera. So I'd like to kind of get your take on, are we seeing now this technology, it's working so well, hopefully today, that we're not going to need to, to, to have these meetings anymore? Am I, am I out of a job, basically, I suppose? Yeah, John. Um, <clears throat> before I just touch on that point, is I'm so happy that the panel is talking about data. I'm a data freak, so therefore, when it doesn't come from me hearing other people speak, I'll go thumbs up. Um, part of having a weak data set is that you can't tell your story convincingly. There's so much leakage out of tourism that other sectors pick up. Let me give an example. When you bring a tourist over traveling from whatever region to South Africa, they get to spend a lot of money in our retail shopping centers. But all of that spend gets recorded as retail and not as tourism. And I honestly claim to it and say, oh, some of that money should actually be in our pot. So therefore, when you look at the tourism numbers coldly, you actually don't see 
any of that benefit coming through. But just to kind of state that as a country, we're doing two things at the moment, as there's African tourism. We're investing quite a lot in technology during this quiet period, both internally in terms of digitalization, making sure that what took 20 steps to do can be done in two steps and automated because we run a global entity with 14 offices around the world in 14 different jurisdictions. So to line all this up must be seamless. Then the other one is to saying investment into external technology that will be used by the sector so that we can collect data at a micro level, even at the SME level to the biggest partner out there so that we can make informed decisions, especially when it comes to our marketing side. The way you market to region X is fundamentally different to region Y as an example. It must be informed by data, but not what the CEO feels like on that day. And I think that's, that's a major shift that you're kind of making in that regard. Then lastly, to kind of answer your question, do you have a job or not going forward? I think we've got to look at it not in terms of scarcity, but rather abundance. What we'll be looking at is not either or, to me it's and, and, right? You do need the physical infrastructure. There is still a need in the sense of magic, in the sense of connection, having people meet together and make big decisions. But at the same time, we'll have now have a bigger community of people being able to kind of dial in remotely. I don't know, I go to a lot of conferences and sometimes I just want to go to three panels, not all 55 of them. So therefore, there'll be an opportunity now for conference organizers to actually give a rate just for three or four sessions that people can dial into and go in and interact and out again, right? So therefore, the audience, I think, is going to be wider as opposed to saying out of the current basket of 100 people, will 30 stay back and not kind of attend, you know? And I think that's where we're going around the world in terms of connectedness. So I see the sector growing as rather to be shrinking. Thank you, Sisa, and I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'd like to thank you all, but uh, just to pick a point, uh, sorry we lost Mohammed, but just to make a point that the CEO of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesia Jima, had earlier also uh, convened uh, a webinar with other, uh, other colleagues and you know, seniors in the industry, and his point also was to be able to build bridges and ensure that tourism boards, private sector, and all of that can come together, because there's no point you know, doing it in silos, so it, uh, it's important to make this point. Also, I would like to, you know, take the three points that the UNWT recommended, just the points, just, just so we can wrap up, because they put up 23, UNWT put up 23 recommendations to uh, member states and government, and in, they touched on three key areas, saying that providing stimulus and accelerating recovery, uh, preparing for tomorrow, but then again, they say prepare well for tomorrow. So, I think it's in the same spirit that we are hoping that, you know, interactions like this will help the SME out there, will help somebody because new business will come out of this. You know, companies will collapse, unfortunately, some will come up. And so I, I believe that people may have the opportunity to reach out to you, you know, as panel on your social uh, channels and uh, it will be great because we have a lot of questions and also grateful for our 317 participant as of now and this is record breaking and thanks thanks guys but they would have the opportunity to reach out to you on twitter i know all of you are very active on twitter and we will send all the things to you but john has some housekeeping things to do then we can uh, proceed or uh, wrap up properly absolutely thank you kojo yeah just before we do i do just want to get um a, just a one minute 90 seconds because we did lose you Mohammed. so if you can give us your closing remarks that'd be fantastic uh, sorry, uh, you lost me there. Uh, so, uh, ah, super. I, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say one, one or two things very quickly, uh, picking up from uh, what Judy had uh, brought up the issue of uh, uh, staff and uh, workers in the tourism industry. I just want to reassure everyone, including uh, Judy, is that this time around, the uh, tourism industry in Kenya have decided to be very responsible. And we have very strong unions that we are working with them. And one of the things that we have done through the, uh, uh, through the unions, both in hotels and tours, is April, May, and June, all the staff are on full pay. 80% of the employees are on permanent, and none of us have actually sent them away. I just want to reassure everyone on that one. Then the next one is that if things don't change from June, we have discussed with the union, and we are going on unpaid leave two weeks and two weeks paid. 
at least people will have 50% of their salary moving forward. And then hopefully, uh, August, September, then probably things will have settled. I think that's a good thing. Uh, in the past, we will throw the stuff under the bus. This time around, we've said that will not happen. So I just want to assure everyone on that. But on um, sustainability, another key thing that's happening, especially in the safari lodges, when people are out of employment, and this is something that we really need to look at seriously, is that uh, poaching will come back because people will start looking for ways and means to earn a living. And I think that's a big threat, considering that our wildlife, especially rhinos, uh, the, the lions, are already on decline. So on sustainability, on the side of conservation, that's a big thing that we need to look at. Let's just not look at the occupancy levels and then say, you know what, uh, other things will take care of themselves. And uh, then on the recovery, I'll encourage every government in Africa to seriously look at supporting tourism. Our government have already done their bit. They've given us around $5 million. They're hoping to give us another uh, $1 million, um, or rather $5 million. They're looking at another $10 million. And hopefully all that put together, that is going to, you know, to help us. And then data, data, data. Africa, we are not good with data. And I think without data, we are shooting in the dark. Once again, thank you very much uh, for this session. Hi, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Mohamed, and thank you all. Uh, I would like to, if you may permit, to read a set of uh, the Secretary General's letter to, to, I mean, to the world, not just to the tourism community, that personally, a personalized letter that, I'll, if you may allow, I'll read a set of it. And it says, uh, it says, dear friends, remain united in facing an unprecedented challenge. The COVID-19 virus does not discriminate. It knows no borders, and we have seen over recent days, nobody is immune. To the health workers on the front line in the fight against the virus, and to everyone working to keep vital supply chains moving. Thank you. The situation is constantly evolving. Predictions, statement of hope, as well as statement of fear become quickly irrelevant. This is particularly true for tourism. Ours has been the sector hardest hit by this crisis, and we cannot say how bad the full impact will be. But tourism will, will return, and we must, take, we must make sure that as the sector grows again, the benefits are felt throughout society, especially where they are needed the most. Two weeks ago, we formed the Global Tourism Crisis Committee. This enjoys high level support from across the sector. It also involves UN agencies among its members. I'm pleased to say we are collaborating to minimize the impact this crisis has on lives and livelihoods. We are also looking to the future united and determined. I trust these recommendations will help guide tourism in the challenging weeks and months ahead. We call on government to include them in their action plans. This way tourism can help lead recovery just as it has done in many times, Zurab Pololikashvili. So that's, that's, that's the words coming from uh, uh, Zurab and from the UNWTO. And again, I'd like to thank you all, the great panelists. And please, some of our questions will be sent to you. And if you have the time, you can still engage us. And we'd like you to you know, prefer other solutions that some SMEs and people can do as we prepare and you know, navigate the situation post also uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much. John, thank you, you thank can, you, can, thank you so much, um, Judy. I'm going to give you uh, going to give you 60 seconds, and then I'll finish finish off the wrap up. So sorry, I only give you 60, but uh, go for it. Uh, my 60 seconds is uh, to uh, encourage Africa to build its tourism growth with supportive and sustainable development programs, because um, if we don't do this we will eventually erode the resources that support this industry and do very little to mend the divisions that society and economic circumstances have created between people. And yet we say that tourism has the potential to take away poverty, which means we say it has the potential to equalize. But if we do not have uh, supportive programs for SMEs and those who are in the lower chain of the tourism industry, tourism, our policies, and whatever we do, whether we call them stimulus programs or whatever programs we do, will not uplift tourism from where it is today. We will go back to our default position for tourism in Africa. Fantastic. Thank you, Judy. Uh, word, of, uh, word of warning, we've got to change, we've got to learn, and we've got to reinvent. So absolutely. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for all our, all our participants. We still have over 300 people 
uh, on the line right now. And what I wanted to do before we go, because this is our first uh, our first webinar, is just to um, allow you to vote on this, whether you enjoyed this, how often you would like us to actually uh, convene and bring different panelists to the uh, to the table. So should we be doing this every two weeks, once a month, every other month? Um, okay, I'll close this off in another 20 seconds or so. But I just want to say as well, thank you for all of the chat. I've seen it. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. We will send those questions over and we'll share them with the panelists. Uh, on Monday, you'll get a you'll get a recording of the YouTube of this whole session. Uh, please share that with anybody you want. It's totally free. It will go on to our podcast as well. Um, and also, uh, you will get the social media links, the LinkedIn profile links for all of our panelists as well. So you can you can uh, reach out to them and add uh, add some value. So I'm going to close this poll now and show you what we said. So uh, overwhelmingly, people want this every other week. So be prepared for two weeks from today. We'll uh, start to get our heads together, Kojo and I. And I just wanted to say, of course, this is a joint venture. This is proof of collaboration in action. Kojo and I got together last week and said, hey, come on, let's bring these communities together now and let's actually walk the walk, not just talk ar around it. And that's what is going to come out of this is we want to create a forum for people to actually join together, have those conversations and move things forward. And the, uh, the final thing that I wanted to, um, I wanted to share with you uh, which I will do right now, is just to let you all know that um, on Tuesday next week, uh, my parent company, Bench Events, is actually running a virtual conference called Hospitality Tomorrow. Everybody is invited. Anita is going to be taking part and potentially some of our other panelists as well. Um, it runs for the full day. It's completely free. You can register at hospitalitytomorrow.com. Once again, thank you all. I will circulate everything on Monday. And we'll see you for the next webinar very soon. So uh, a big wave from all of the uh, panelists and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for joining us.